We'll start uh, this morning. Uh, Dr. Oman Jeba will chair the session on forensic studies and uh, medical diagnosis. So, you, Dr. Uh, Olga, please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Suen. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Thank you. So, welcome to everyone to the special Thank session. You. Good morning, good uh, good day, I guess, and uh, good evening, whoever is coming from uh, whatever part of the world. And we're very happy to be together here to uh, to hear the latest achievements of our colleagues. So we start according to what Nicola told me. There is a bit of change in the order. We start with the papers of. Um, and Dr. Jacobi, uh, perfect. So you will be adding a bit of the uh, Morocco taste to your presentation. <laughs> sunshine. Yes. And uh, definitely, yes. There is sunshine. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Olga. So, yeah, I have two presentations. So, uh, yeah, first I guess I need to share. So you can go ahead and uh, present your work, paper one, okay. and then the second paper. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the first uh, paper I'm, go I'm going to present is um, uh, regarding interpretation of uh, deep uh, glucose uh, um, predictive models for diabetic people using what we call the retained neural network architecture. Uh, so this is the work of our PhD student, uh, Maxime Debois, that I'm directing with uh, Professor Mehdi Ami. Um, so just in terms of context, you know that diabetes is one of the most important uh, pathologies in the world, uh, whether uh, regarding so with two main problems, hypoglycemia or uh, hyperglycemia. So it is important to have uh, machine learning predictive models for glucose uh, with two application, uh, three applications in mind uh, as a warning system, as a, for cl closed loop devices, or for uh, therapeutic education. Uh, so the goal of this study, actually the context is that uh, we all know that uh, deep neural networks are, uh, ha are very accurate today, but mainly they are considered as black boxes. Uh, so the problem is that in healthcare, actually uh, in interpretability of the model is uh, very important. So what we propose here is to have a neural network architecture that, that can be interpreted in terms of a decision. So this, uh, this is why we propose this uh, retain a neural uh, the, the prediction, not only the prediction, but also uh, the interpretability of the decision. So basically, since we don't have a lot of time, I guess go uh, quickly over the architecture. So basically here you have, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you see my mouse. Uh, so here in the middle, you, you, you see the, the main neural network architecture, a usual one for prediction. So just uh, based on the input sequence of data regarding uh, glucose, uh, insulin and food intake. Uh, so this is a sequence we use like uh, LSTM model. Uh, that is forwarded and then we predict the value of glucose within the next 30 minutes or one hour or two, two hours. Uh, so this is uh, having a model like this, uh, it can work very well, but it will be basically uh, a black box. So here what we add is two layers that you see here, one on the right side and the other one on the left side with uh, some embeddings that uh, that are actually parameter, uh, parametrized with some weight that we see that are called here the alphas and the alphas actually this weight will sorry uh, these alphas actually each alpha will encode the weights of each time step what is the weight of each time step in the sequence regarding the decision okay and on the left side we we go even more uh, further than this at each time step, we extract a feature vector, which is actually related to the main parameters, the variables like uh, glucose, uh, food intake, and insulin. And actually here, we will have at each time step a vector, beta, that 
will encode the importance of each variable, of each of those variables on the final decision. So we see there are two layers that I'll explain further. So the, the, uh, here in the beginning, we have a usual uh, neural network, LSTM, that will compute some embedding, that will generate some embedding based on the input sequence. Based on this embedding that we generate, now we will add a new layer uh, the parameters of which will encode the importance of each time step, okay, that you see here as alphas. And then on the left side, we have another layer, the parameters of which, which are vectors, beta, will encode the importance of each R, uh, variable at each time step, okay? Uh, once we do this, actually, we can compute the final layer here, we can generate the final layer, that will be a combination of the three layers here. So the usual one, but also the time step weight, weight and the other layer regarding the importance of each variable. And the, and the final decision actually will be a combination of all these layers. So uh, the, important, the, the, the advantage of this scheme is that at the end, so you see here, we have the prediction at each time step we are interested in. For example, pH, it, it means uh, uh, horizon, uh, horizon time. So we are able to predict the value of uh, glucose within 30 minutes, one hour, et cetera. But what is interesting, is that we are able to measure the importance of each variable at each time step. In this way, we are able to make interpretation. What are the most important variables in the sequence that made such a decision? Okay, so this is basically the architecture. So we have experimented on a, a database of, uh, from uh, diabetic people of type two. Uh, and so we do some pre-processing, uh, just normalization of the data, cleaning, and so on. And you see here there is a split in terms of the training, data, and tests. So there is uh, first the training set is uh, split into 75 and 25 percent training and validation, and then we have uh, remaining data kept for for test. For comparison purpose, so we compare with two baseline models. One is random forest, and the other one is just a classical LSTM-based uh, uh, neural network. So in this case, it will be a black box, and we compare them with our architecture, the retained neural network architecture, which is interpretable. And we did this comparison when we tried to make the prediction uh, 30 minutes ahead of time. Okay, so what is the value of course, within the next 30 minutes. And uh, for, for uh, evaluation, we use uh, root mean square error and the mean absolute percentage error. So in terms of results, this is what you see here. So we have the three model, random forest, LSTM, and retain. So the, the first important thing that we see uh, that in terms that the retain is much better than random forest. So we see uh, the RMC much lower uh, and also the map. And when we compare to the LSTM, basically we have the same results. And this is very good news for us because uh, as I told you before, LSTM uh, is a classical neural architecture, is very good, but it is a kind of black box. With our retained neural network architecture, in terms of the advantage of both words, the accuracy of neural network, but also the interpretability. Okay, so here in terms now of uh, the uh, uh, the maximum absolute uh, normalized. Uh, uh, Content. This graph is interesting. We see in three colors actually the uh, the history of glucose, of insulin, and uh, 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 actually uh, carbohydrates, uh, food intake, and we can measure actually what is the importance of each of these variables through time. Okay, so to, so we have each one of the trajectories have different slopes. Uh, what we can see actually is that. Uh, the uh, the glucose one, which is the blue one, is has the most uh, lasting effects. 
We see, for example, that insulin and uh, food intake, their effect is high in the beginning, but it fades away quickly right from the beginning, within like, uh, I would say, like 15 minutes or so. While the glucose, actually, its effect lasts much more. And this is what we had in mind to be able not only to have a good decision, but also to be uh, able to measure what is the importance of each variable to time. So uh, I uh, come now to the conclusion. So basically what we have uh, proposed, this is a retained neural network architecture that has the advantage over classical neural network that we can have uh, interpretation of the decision in terms of the importance of each one of the input variables per time. And actually, we see that this new architecture in terms of per performance remain as accurate as uh, the convol uh, convolutional neural network. That's also, I finished my first presentation. I don't know if you want to, if you want to ask a question right now or should I follow with the next? Uh, I would uh, prefer if the questions are asked now. What is the meaning of sequential medical images for input samples of retain? Is actually, basically different from the batch. No, actually, here we are just interested in uh, any. Kind, so this this study was regarding diabetes, mm -hmm. and the idea is that uh, basically we have a patient that uh, uh, that we try to monitor through time over time. So the person may take some food, may may eat something. Uh, the patient may take uh, insulin at some point, and we have also the historic uh, value of glucose through some uh, some uh, uh, electronic device. So in this case, so it means that we have a sequential data, okay? And uh, uh, the study that we are targeting is how to do predictive model based on the se sequential inputs, okay? Uh, so we are in the context not only of diabetes, but of any problem regarding uh, healthcare for which the data are sequ sequential and we want to make some prediction, like for example, arrhythmia or, or anything else. So everything we have proposed is, can be applicable in this case. Thank you. I hope this answers the questions. Uh, Dr. Yu Fang, okay, good. So thank you for the answer. Are there more questions? I Okay, so questions uh, session will be closed for this paper and you can start the presentation of the second. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Olga. Uh, so the, the, the next work I'm going to, uh, to present is regarding biometrics uh, this time. And this is a joint work with uh, Dr. Huafing Xin from, uh, from China. Uh, and uh, so what, so the, the work is regarding hand vein recognition, you know, uh, hand vein, palm vein recognition is one of the most uh, uh, promising biometrics uh, uh, for several reasons. It's because the vein patterns are beneath uh, the skin, so it's much harder to fake as a, uh, as a, um, as a biometrics. And besides, actually, the blood needs to circulate in the, in the, in the body. Uh, for in order to imagine to work, the, the acquisition uh, in order to work, the blood needs to be uh, circulating. So it has two main advantages over, like, uh, for example, uh, uh, fingerprint. Uh, so what we propose here is uh, an end-to-end -end generative adversarial network for hand vein uh, recognition. Uh, so as I said, actually, hand vein. Uh, sorry. Hand vein uh, prototypes uh, today are all over uh, the world. Uh, they are uh, deployed, uh, so either for access control systems, for ATM and banking, for uh, mass rapid transit, like for example in airports and so on. And uh, you see here, this is uh, one of uh, typical actually acquisition uh, of uh, the, the vein patterns. You have uh, contactless vein. Uh, 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 capturing device, which is good for uh, hygienic uh, concerns. Uh, the image as acquired uh, via infrared, uh, inf infrared imaging, and then uh, based on some image processing or something else, some uh, like a deep neural network, 
uh, we can acquire the vein patterns. And these vein patterns, this is what we call segmentation, extracting the vein patterns, we can do them, we can use them for, for verification, for matching purposes. Uh, now, in terms of challenges, uh, so you see here some example of, uh, of, uh, of the hand uh, acquired from infrared image where these images are subject to uh, various uh, factors like uh, illumination uh, changes, light scattering, uh, ambient temperature, uh, physiological, physiological, uh, physiological changes, and even user behavior. Uh, and uh, they, uh, uh, as a result, actually, the, the, the capture image may include some noise, uh, some irregular shadow, and so on. So uh, 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 all these kind of uh, uh, issues can actually uh, degrade the performance of uh, verification, of matching. That's why it's very important to have a very robust segmentation techniques to, to extract in a robust way the vein patterns. In terms of state of the arts, uh, we can split them into two major categories. Uh, I would say the most uh, over uh, the past, I would say 20 years, uh, the state of the art was dominated by handcrafted segmentation approach based basically on image processing techniques like uh, Gabor filters or, others, or other techniques to extract uh, the vein patterns. And much more recently, I would say over the last uh, three, three years or, or, or two, uh, we have the emergence of deep learning based uh, techniques that try to extract directly uh, without any handcrafted techniques the, the, the vein patterns. Actually, we have with Dr. Huafinkin, we have already published uh, several, several papers uh, with their conference or journal papers on, based on deep neural networks for, for the same purposes. Uh, uh, so the, the main problem of with handcrafted segmentation appro approach, you know that image processing techniques, uh, they are handcrafted, so uh, uh, actually they may work for some database, but not others, not, uh, not for other databases or for other acquisition devices, because each time we have to tune to adapt to algorithms to the specific conditions. Deep neural networks uh, actually uh, overcome this kind of problems because uh, they are learnable uh, models. They just whatever the, the new environment, you just can train the model and it adapts automatically to the, to the context. But uh, one of the major problems with current deep neural uh, models is that actually they try to uh, segment each pixel separately. So it, it, it uh, actually it classify each pixel in the image either as belonging to the vein pattern or not. And this makes, uh, this, makes uh, this uh, deep learning uh, based segmentation model quite heavy in terms of computation. Uh, so here what we propose, it's still a deep neural network, but based on generative adversarial, uh, adversarial neural network for segmentation, for segmenting automatically the vein patterns. So this is the main uh, pipeline of our model. So we start with the input image. I will show first how we label the images in terms of the vein patterns for training purposes. And then we use our gain, uh, gain based vein segmentation. And then once we segment, we do the matching in order to perform verification. So in, uh, you know, uh, anytime you want to do some training with the, whatever the kind of deep neural network or, or any supervised model, actually we need to have labeled data. For, for uh, vein uh, images, actually we don't have such labels. So what I mean by labels is that for such gray level image, we need to label each pixel whether it belongs to a vein pattern or not. Okay, so uh, as you see, it's a heavy task and uh, it's uh, very time consuming in terms, uh, even in terms of uh, 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 material cost. So what we propose in our work instead is to use some uh, automatic labeling based on existing state of the art uh, uh, segmentation techniques, which are not necessarily deep learning based. So here, what you see like baseline one, two, three, and four, these are some ones of the main state of the art vein uh, verification uh, systems. So we use them, you see the result of segmentation based on the input. And 
with all this is uh, with uh, what we do at the end we combine the decision of these baselines basically some intersection with some smoothing to come up with the final uh, uh, segmented image that we use that we consider as a labeled image even if it is not 100 percent accurate uh, the most important thing for us is just most of the case the labeling is correct and we can see that the, the, the segmentation looks pretty good because actually it's better than any of each of the model separately. Now, uh, once we have labeled uh, the data, uh, uh, so we see, you see here the kind of inputs and labeled image. You can see here, see it here. This is what we call the ground truth. For each input, we have the associated labeled image as I just described. So this is what we call a real pair. Alongside this, we will consider synthetic pair based on the same input image. We are going to use a GAN, so generated adversarial network, to generate automatically a, a binary uh, vein image through a GAN generator. So this is a neural network generator. Okay, so in this case, we end up with the synthetic pair because this is synthesized by the generator, by the neuron, by the GAN generated, and we have the real pair. And we add a neural network, which is now a CNN, a discriminator that will try to discriminate between the real pair and the synthetic pair. Okay, uh, and actually, uh, the objective function will, uh, we will take the gradient and propagate it forward in order to make the generated generator as accurate as possible in order to try to fake this discriminator so that this discriminator is not able uh, no more to distinguish between the real pair and the synthetic pair once the generated succeeds in doing this it means that it is able to segment automatically the any input image that's why actually the discriminator is no longer able to, dis to, to distinguish between the real pair and the synthetic pair. So this is the overall uh, framework in general of uh, GAN models, but here we use it and adapt it for our specific case of not for recognition, but for uh, binarization of vein images. Okay, so this is the, the, the model here is the generator, you know, it's a known UNET neural network architecture. This is what is done here to generate, to synthesize a binary image from the input. And you see, the, basically, it uh, consists of several layers. First, there is a phase of compression, compression of the data and then uh, dilatation or incompression of the data. So this is a typical, actually, neural network architecture. And this is for the discriminator. This is just a typical CNN neural network that is used at this stage to try to discriminate, to discriminate between real pair and synthetic pair. Okay? So this is just a, a, a classical CNN. And in terms of, of, uh, of the loss function, it is actually a combination of the two ones. You see here that has, so we have a loss function associated with the generator the neural network, and another one associated with the CNN discriminator. And the overall loss is a combination of the two. Okay. And in this case, we are able to train this model. And the, at the end, we will, uh, we, we, uh, the end result will have a generator that is able to segment, to generate a vein image that is associated with the binarization of the input. So, uh, so we have experimented uh, this model uh, on a known database, Kezia from, uh, from China. It is very known, one of the largest one. Uh, so here we see the original image. Uh, so we detect the region of interest. There is some scale normalization of uh, the region of interest that is submitted to our, to our model. So for, uh, for performance evalu evaluation, we compute the EER equal error rate computation that is the, the most used in, uh, 
uh, in biometrics in general, which is actually a trade-off between the genius, uh, false acceptation rate and false rejection rate. And here, uh, so I will show you two evaluation, one qualitative one and the other one quantitative. So this is the qualitative one. So here you see the input image. The first four, so B, C, D, E, are the result of binary, binarization of classical techniques based on image processing techniques. The, the F, the, the, the last but uh, previous one, is based on classical deep neural networks. Actually, this is one that we have developed before. And the last image is the one that is uh, given by, by our, provided by our proposed model. So what we see that both the last two images are much better than the first four. And the last two, as I said, are based on deep neural networks. But we see that our, the new model based on GAN is even much better than the classical deep neural network. So if you see, uh, for example, here, you see that uh, the vein patterns are much more connected. In terms of connectivity, it is much better than, than the deep neural networks. Here you can see another example here. You can see that actually the, 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 the much connected than, than here. So this in terms of analysis, in terms of and what I provide here is the equal error rate, the computation uh, time, and we compare with several. Uh, do you still hear me? Because uh, I see. Hello. Yes, we do hear oh, you. Uh, okay, perfect. From time to time, yes, we do okay. hear you. Okay, perfect. So, so we compare our approach with several techniques, including ours, uh, our previous work uh, based on CNN. The other four, first four, as I said, are based on image processing techniques like Gabor filters, Hessian phase, maximum principal curvature, and repeated, repeated line tracking. So all of these are uh, image processing based. So, and here you can see the uh, equal uh, error rates. So we see that CNN is much better than the others. And what is interesting that new approach based on GAN is even much better, dramatically better than the CNN, the deep neural networks, because it's cut the error rate but, but by more than uh, half. And in terms also of computation uh, time, uh, actually it's much, much uh, more uh, faster, as you see, it's uh, uh, really nothing to compare. And uh, as I said, uh, uh, so the, our previous neural network, deep neural network was uh, long, took longer than the other image processing techniques because it had to classify each pixel uh, in a separate way. So each, while here our gal actually it uh, generates all the image at once. That's why it's much, much more faster. So we have here, we gain uh, uh, significant gain in terms of error rate and computation time. Now, if we look at the, uh, over all the curve, you know, in the trade-off between fast acceptation rates and fast rejection rates, we see again the comparison, the, the comparison between different metals. So, uh, so since we're here, we are talking about uh, error rates. So each time the curve is, uh, lower it means that it is better so uh, so here this uh, the, f the one that is highest is repeated line tracking so this is one of the image processing techniques and actually ours i don't know if we s you see it here it's, it's actually here it is very it is by far the lowest and this is not surprising it's because the error rate is much much lower than all the others so here we have the confirmation that uh, our approach is much better whatever the trade-off that we choose in terms of compromise between false acceptation rate and false rejection rate. Uh, so this is my final slide. I come to the conclusion. So what we have proposed is a new uh, neural network approach uh, to uh, automatically extract the vein patterns from a, a gray level uh, vein image. Our approach is end to end, so uh, end to end. It doesn't need any image processing techniques, and it uses directly uh, the generative adversarial, uh, adversarial network. And so we don't need, uh, we don't need any handcrafted techniques. 
Uh, and in terms of results, we have uh, dramatic improvements, both of on verification accuracy, meaning the error rate, equal error rate, and also in terms of uh, computation time. So uh, thank you for attention. Uh, attention. And uh, if you have any question, I will answer with pleasure. Thank you so much for your very nice presentation. Actually, two presentations. It's very interesting. The work is very, very important. And uh, let me see Thank if you have questions. Yeah, there is one question for the second presentation. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, I, I do. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so the question is, when a binary classifier is used to decide whether a synthesized hand vein image is real or fake, is confidence yes. used? And uh, if the answer is yes, above uh, how much is real, such as 50% or 50% or more? You mean what is the what is the performance of this binary discriminator? Uh, is real okay? Basically, if the confidence is used to decide whether it is a real or fake image. Mm -hmm. And if the answer is yes, there is a second question. Uh, no, actually, yeah, the, 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 the confidence is, is used because actually, you see here, it is this discrimination, there is, there is a loss function associated with it, okay? This is what we call L binary. So, of course, depending of, of, uh, of the error of this discriminator, this error is propagated to learn the the, the, neuro, the, the the whole neural network, okay? That's right. So the confidence is used naturally. So because the value of the error when trying to discriminate between the real pair and synthetic pair, this value of the error is propagated itself. Okay. Then the second, uh, second part of the question is how much uh, is real such as 50% or more? how to set confidence based on experience? Actually, actually, we don't need uh, uh, to set any confidence. Uh, what, we, what we do here, you know, how, how, how does it work? Actually, we have a training database with ground, what we call ground truth pairs. So you see we have the input vein image and the generated labeled image through our uh, combination of uh, uh, biometric system. So this is the real image. And there, in, here, we have a neural network generator that will try to generate uh, vein patterns from grade level. So, of course, in the beginning, since the neuron, this generator start to learn, it is very uh, bad in the beginning. It doesn't synthesize well uh, the, the, the vein patterns. So in the beginning, the discriminator is, is very accurate. Okay, it's, it, it can distinguish very easily between synthetic pair and the real pair. Okay, but since actually the error, actually uh, uh, what I didn't say, actually what we propagate here backward is the inverse of the of of this of the error. So if if the if the if uh, if the binary discriminator behaves well. We invert the error and we propagate it in order to change, to, uh, in order to compel, to obligate the generator to change the, synth the synthesis in such a way that the discrimination becomes harder and harder. So in the beginning, the discrimination is very good, but at each epoch, it start to, the discrimination uh, accuracy starts to decrease. Okay? Yeah, thank you very much for answering the question. Thank you for your presentations again. And uh, I think because we don't have much time, maybe Nicola, you can start uh, showing the videos of the remaining three presentations. Hey, everyone. I'd like to thank you all for being here. My name is Rabiel Kuda, and today I'll be presenting the work titled A Survey on Peripheral Blood Smear Analysis Using Deep Learning, authored by Dr. Suin and myself. Okay, now let me introduce the outline of this talk. I will start by presenting the medical background. 
Um, and then I'll go through the general research trends. And finally, the current challenges and possible future work will be discussed. Blood tests play a vital role in diagnosing many medical conditions, especially when considered with clinical symptoms. Different kinds of blood tests are available in medical labs, but today we'll focus on two of them. The first test is called complete blood count with differential or CBC with differential, and it's one of the most commonly requested blood tests in labs. The CBC test counts the three main blood cell types, which are RBCs, WBCs, and platelets. The differential test counts the main five subtypes of WBCs. This test is performed by placing a tube filled with blood in an automated analyzer. Hence, this test is not done manually anymore, and it does not take more than a minute to get the results uh, from the automated analyzer. But in many cases, the CBC with differential test is not enough, and a blood smear is requested. A blood smear or a blood film is the result of spreading and staining a thin layer of blood on a microscope slide. Um, lab specialists need blood films to identify blood cells that are beyond the capabilities of the morphological, uh, um, of the automated analyzer, sorry, such as morphological abnormalities. This test mainly assesses 17 types of cells and yet is still being performed manually. The figure here shows how a blood smear looks like under a microscope. From this fast background, we can conclude that blood smears are mainly prepared for detecting abnormalities, not for classifying the main normal blood cell types. Computer researchers focused mainly on three distinct directions in this context. Now I'll present the main findings of each direction from the literature. Okay, let's begin with the malaria detection literature. Uh, to diagnose malaria, experts in medical labs typically look for parasites infecting some RBCs in blood smears. We observe that the most commonly used data set for this purpose is the NIH data set, which consists of 27,000 light microscopic cell images with equal instances of infected and uninfected segmented RBCs. Multiple techniques and methods were proposed, as you can see here in the table. And for example, the work in 11 here ensembled a VGG19, a squeeze net, and an inception net, and a CNN in different combinations. The combination that worked best was the VGG19 and squeeze net with an accuracy of 99.5. The second research direction highlights the work proposed for classifying uh, different types of blood cells and morphological abnormalities in PBSs or blood films. For example, the work in 22 utilized a private data set of uh, 14,700 uh, annotated whole slide blood smears that include 11 categories uh, of blood cell types Different variations of SSD and YOLO V3 were examined, and the highest mean average precision scored was 92%. That this score was achieved using a YOLO V3 with an input resolution of 320 by 320. And finally, the last direction. Uh, in the last direction, deep networks were utilized for leukemia diagnosis. We observed that the most commonly used data set for this purpose is the all IDB data set, which is composed of 108 whole slide images and is annotated for the purpose of leukemia diagnosis. Multiple techniques and methods were proposed, as you can see here in the table. For example, the work in um, 36 feature, in, in this work, feature maps were extracted from the all IDB data set using and AlexNet, CafeNet, VGG, uh, Deep Networks, uh, before being classified using an SVM and a random forest, and using the algorithm random forest. The authors also experimented the concatenation of um, feature maps obtained by the same Deep Networks. The feature space was reduced by utilizing PCA technique 
and the majority voting rule to combine the outcomes obtained by each classifier. The work achieved a, an accuracy score of 100%. Now, after exploring the literature, let's have a look at the current challenges and future directions associated with this research domain. Okay, many data-related challenges are present in this research context, and this is due to many, many reasons that I summarize in uh, three categories. The first category is related to the gap between supply and demand, because deep networks are well known for being data hungry, so we have a very high demand on data. On the other hand, the supply is very limited, as obtaining medical data sets can be very challenging due to privacy constraints. And even if you were lucky enough to obtain a data set, you'd still need a medical expert to annotate it for you. And finding a medical expert who's willing to devote enough time for this task is not easy. The second group of challenges are domain-specific challenges. First, some blood cell subtypes are rare in occurrence. For example, the researcher Gaston and his group reported in their uh, paper that they were only able to collect three samples of plasma cells in three years in an average of one cell per year. Hence, having a sufficient number of blood smears containing such rare types for training a data-hungry deep network might take many years. Moreover, data sets are naturally imbalanced, and this is due to the natural distribution of different cell types and subtypes in blood. Finally, the last group of challenges is related to the available data sets. First, most data sets employed in this research area are private. Moreover, many public blood smear data sets are for segmented blood cells, which means, like you can see here in the figure, which means that only one blood cell appears in each instance, which causes inconvenience in real applications. And finally, the available public data sets are only annotated for the main blood cell types. Uh, and the normal uh, subtypes of WBCs, which is enough for the CVC with differential test, but it's not enough for uh, blood smears analysis. All these challenges usually leave researchers with two choices, either narrow down research scope or go through the costly procedure uh, of collecting and annotating a data set. A very promising solution for all these challenges is generating synthetic data. Uh, we have observed, uh, we have also observed other issues in the literature. For example, most of the work uh, in the literature still utilize blood smears for automating uh, CBC with differential, rather than examining morphological abnormalities, which has created a gap between what's being proposed in the literature and what's needed in medical labs. Finally, a research direction that has not been tackled in the context of uh, PBS analysis is virtual staining. If computers manage to uh, do virtual staining accurately, this will save time, money, and will eliminate chances of procedure errors. Finally, I'd like to conclude this talk by thanking you all for being here. Have a great day and stay safe. Hello everyone. This presentation is about abusive language detection using birth pre-training embedding. The usage of social network is growing rapidly for sharing private and uh, intimate information that assists users to get in close contact with others. However, sharing such information may lead to social consequences. For example, Messages posts can contain the sharing of some kind of toxic content, which can yield threats like cyberbullying. Recent studies show the prevalence of the toxic language in social network and raises the necessity to detect toxic language. Detecting toxic language is often more difficult than one expects for two reasons. One is deliberately noisy inputs. The intentional usage of the obfuscation of words and phrases 
Mrs. Falling, Ray Words make Taisic language detection difficult. As models consider all of these noisy words as a non words and lose the ability to distinguish between actual rare words and deliberately noisy words. Um, another obstacle in abusive language detection is the shortage of the labeled data. For example, the only available data in Twitter has a few hundred thousand human labeled examples. However, this quantity is not sufficient to train a significant number of parameters in deep learning. As a result of these two issues, machine learning models suffer from a low recall in toxic language detection. To improve the performance of deep learning models, several approaches have been proposed. For example, Mishra et al. have proposed to use neural character-based models to address noisy inputs. Shirsagar has addressed the lack of the annotated data by using pre-trained embedding to improve recall of their model. Um, to the best of our knowledge, there is no work which address both noisy input and the data deficiency at the same time. In this paper, we propose to utilize BERT to simultaneously deal with these two problems. Um, BERT is an attention mechanism that learns contextual relation between the words. Uh, BERT uses word piece tokenizer. What's a word piece tokenizer? It is the um, NLP technique to segment words into a split and into the more frequent subwords. So BERT uses WordPress tokenizer, which gives a good balance between the flexibility of single character and the efficiency of the full words. Therefore, it allows encoding of the noise input as a sequence of the subword's token, which includes single characters if no larger tokens are appropriate. And it also preserves the semantic of the common subwords in the representation. Moreover, BERT can use mask language model to train pre-trained embedding for subword tokens only by using not labeled data. Pre-trained BERT models can efficiently be fine-tuned in another task even with low amount of labeled data. In this work, we use pre-trained BERT models and fine tune them on toxic language detection task. Um, so let's go to the more details. We utilize, as I said, we utilize BERT to obtain a fixed dimensional representation of the inputs and a fully connected neural network to predict whether the inputs contain toxic language or not. As this figure shows, the input of the model is a sequence of the tokens, each token obtained from the word piece. And the output is a sequence of the vectors in which each vector corresponds to an input token with the same index. In BERT, an additional token is added to the input, which is referred as CLS. The final hidden state of CLS is assumed to represent the aggregate sequence input. The token is used to predict the classes. So uh, let's look at the data. We, in this paper, we used two data sets for the literature to train and evaluate our own classifier. Uh, the first one is Twitter, which contain around 15,000 uh, tweets. And the other is Wikipedia, which we utilize the toxicity and personal attack data set of comments collected from the English Wikipedia attack page. And uh, so, okay, let's look at the experimental setup. We normalize the input by lowercasing all words. Then we use BERT tokenizer, which as I mentioned before, it contains the word piece tokenization to split words into the subword. 
we selected birth days as a pre-trained birth model. The model contained of 12 transformer blocks, two of the attention head, and 768 hidden dimension with a total parameter of 110 million. The classifier is trained with a batch size of eight, dropout probability was 0.1, and we used Adam optimizer. So, okay, let's now look at the result. As uh, the table reports, all results along with the state of the art results on Wikipedia and Twitter dataset. As the table shows, we outperform the state of the art on Wikipedia data here and achieve comparable results on Twitter dataset. One primary reason for outperforming the state of the art in Wikipedia is the use of the pre trained model which is trained on Wikipedia articles. It decreases the number of the unknown words, expose the model, and helps it to better train uh, the toxic comments in the domains. In addition to these experiments, we conducted experiments with and without employing a bird pre-trained language model on, on Twitter and Wikipedia dataset to show the importance of the using pre-trained embedding. As it's shown in this table, pre-trained embedding significantly improved the abusive language pre prediction. For both Wikipedia and Twitter dataset, the BERT model with pre-trained provide with the similar precision at the model, trained from scratch. However, we can see a significant improvement in recall in both datasets. The reason for this improvement is that we do not need to train all the model's parameters from scratch. Therefore, with all current data sets, we will still can learn a model which predicts abusive language without losing the model generalization. So let's just skip the result and discussion because of a lack of the time. And um, conclusion and future work. In this work, we demonstrate the BERT model with the capability of the encoding a deep sense of language context can be successfully utilized for the toxic language detection test. We find the BERT model on Wikipedia dataset and Twitter dataset, two common dataset in the toxic language detection test, and achieve a better performance compared to the state of the art results. For the future work, we suggest retraining WordPiece tokenizer for a large domain specific on label data. And then pre-train birth language model on this data set. Therefore, the model will be able to better understand the domain specific language and accordingly predict the toxic comments in the domain. Thank you, everyone. Classification of criminal news over time using bidirectional LSTM. The authors of the document are Mireya Tobar Vidal, Emanuel Santo Rodriguez, and Jose Alejandro Reyes Ortiz. Introduction. Currently, we have a large amount of data which increases every second, and this trend will only increase in the future, but most of this data is not structured. Text processing is a very important task because most of the information available is found in written form. Because of this, finding a set of tools to exploit the knowledge contained in text is indispensable. Text classification is the task of assigning la labels to a text according to its content. This is one of the most important tasks of processing natural language because it allows us to apply text classification in different areas such as spam detection, sentiment analysis, content detection, inappropriate, social network monitoring, etc. In this paper, an approach for crime news classification based on the headlines collected from Twitter using deep learning is proposed. A baseline is provided to compare the performance of our approach in terms of accuracy, recall, and F1. 
The task description. The task for this paper is to classify crime news in Spanish into six categories according to their titles. The titles are classified into six categories such as rape, kidnapping, homicide, suicide, assault, and exploitation. The model proposed in this paper consists of the following components, but I'll only discuss the embedding, LSTM, and max pooling layers. The embedding layer here, the input layer for this model is a dense vector representation of the words in the document feed into the input, where each word is represented by a real value. Given the relatively small dat dataset, we decide to use retrain embeddings rather than training the words embeddings. Therefore, we employ Spanish word embeddings, which are training on the Spanish billion word corpus using word to vec On the LSTM layer, for this approach, we want to exploit both future and past information. Therefore, we propose a bidirectional long short term memory. This architecture is more effective than unidirectional LSTMs and is appropriate for tasks where context is crucial. Also, it's convenient to have access to future and past context for sequence modeling tasks. The max pooling layer, we employ a one-dimension global max pooling layer after the bidirectional LSTM layer to extract representative information. This reduces the dimensionality but keeps the key information. However, this operation loses information about locality of the words in a text. In 15th reference, the impact of the pooling strategy is discussed, and it is stated that one max pooling outperforms other pooling strategies for sentence classification. Here is the architecture overview. Uh, we can see the layers, the input layer, embedding layer, the bidirectional LSTM layer, the global max pooling layer, the fully connected layer, the dropout layer, and the output layer. The dataset description. For this task, we use a dataset that consists in crime news headlines from 24 Mexican news groups Twitter accounts collected from November 2017 to June 2019, accounting for a total of 7,988 tweets. Each tweet is assigned to a label out of six rape, kidnapping, homicide, suicide, assault, or exploitation. However, it is important to highlight that the classes are imbalanced since most crimes committed are homicides and assault. This data set was split in 60% for training, 20% for validation, and 20% for test. The models used. The baseline support vector machine is taken as baseline for classifying the news. We apply preprocessing to the news headlines. Then we converted the headlines into vectors with 10,000 features. The bidirectional LSTM, the network is trained to minimize the binary cross entropy loss using Adam optimization with batch size 64 during 50 epochs. We use 190 units for both LSTM and fully connected layers. The L2 regularization used in the order of the 10 tree and the dropout was set to 0 0.15. For the embedding layer, we employ the 300 dimensional word vectors. Here are the results. The table one, we have the classification report for the proposed model. With respect to the baseline, the scores for precision are similar in kidnapping and rape classes, but for the rest are lower than the proposed model. This can be observed especially in the exploitation class, where our model scores 100% precision while the baseline obtains 60%. However, the baseline recall and F1 scores are worse than the proposal for the classes with the lowest support.
However, when comparing the models, it can be seen in Table 3 that the by LSTM model outperforms the baseline in all the metrics used. The x axis is the day divided in hours while y axis is the rate prime. In the chart, it is observed the hourly rate primes for the predicted labels of the test set. Each color represents a type of prime. Red for assault, yellow for exploitation, green for murder, cyan for kidnapping, dark blue for suicide, and magenta for rape. According to the obtained results, we derive the following conclusions. Most common crimes are assault and homicide, which reaches its peak at 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. respectively. The hour with less committed crimes is at 4 a.m., 13 crimes, and the hour with most committed crimes is at 10 p.m., 169 crimes. At 4 a.m., besides the predominant crimes, the only crime committed is rape. The predominant crimes obtained through the collection is our data set are consistent with the information shown in the table 1. The conclusions are that this approach allowed us to classify correctly most of the instances in the test set and it is also outperformed the baseline. Despite obtaining higher F1 and recall, SVM should be favored for this task due to lower computational complexity. However, this proposal is feasible to, use, to be used on large datasets. As future work, we plan to explore other deep learning architectures and work embeddings for this task. Finally, it's crucial to highlight the importance of ML tasks for Spanish since more works focus on English. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, gracias, for this presentation. It's uh, very interesting. I have seen there are questions as well to the authors and um, there are in the questions and answers section. So because of the lack of time, I would suggest to contact the authors directly. Uh, their contact information is provided with the publications and uh, if you have trouble contacting them, then uh, definitely we can help. You can uh, just text us or uh, email us to, to the conference. Nicole, I'm sure, has all the contact information. So thank you again, all of you, for the presentations. And uh, I will leave it now to Dr. Suen to introduce the next step of the conference. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Olga for uh, chairing the session. So, so now uh, I have already put in the chat the program. So uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, all the people for attending the conference, all the speakers, uh, all the keynotes for their excellent talks uh, during the conference. So we hear a lot of new directions, new ideas, and new topics, and a lot of different applications. So uh, I also wish to thank uh, the uh, Professor Patrick Wang for uh, giving us the opportunity of uh, putting in a special issue for the International Journal of pattern recognition and artificial intelligence. I also wish to thank Professor Wai Wai Tang for preparing a special issue for the International Journal of uh, Wavelet and uh, Multimodal and uh, in Information Processing. And also uh, would like to thank uh, Dr. Malaya Blom and uh, Nicola Nobili and for preparing a new book in the area of new frontiers in pattern recognition and inter international uh, artificial intelligence. 
So we are working on these special issues and uh, we are also uh, working on the new book. So after the conference, we will work resume immediately on the review process and uh, make decisions and uh, give you hints on helping you to uh, revise your papers, chapters, so that we'll have uh, excellent special issues and the new book. So according to the program, uh, we have the presentation of the French team. So Professor Nicole Vincent and Professor Kurtz, are you ready? Yes, we are. Uh -huh. um, let, let me um, share my screen so that you can uh, see the presentation. Um, so first of all, I wanted to thank, uh, to thank uh, uh, you for uh, the organization and uh, the preparation of uh, uh, the two last in instances of uh, XPI and uh, to have given us uh, the opportunity of uh, uh, organizing uh, next uh, instance in uh, 22 and uh, to and we are very happy to welcome you in uh, in Paris um, and more precisely in University de Paris uh, to uh, work uh, for the XPI 22. So you see, uh, XPI will have been uh, all over the, the world, uh, from Montreal to China, and uh, now from uh, China to, to Europe, and uh, in Europe to uh, France, and uh, in France to Paris, uh, in the Université de Paris, that is a, a very young but famous university that is located, uh, as you see uh, on the uh, on the right uh, in, um, at the heart of Paris and uh, it's uh, historically a part of the prestigious Sorbonne where you see uh, the, where is the central part of our university. But um, it's uh, also a very active and leading French university that has been built from the fusion of two university and uh, a great institution uh, on uh, physics uh, of, uh, of the earth and we, we have uh, about uh, 63,000 students and uh, nearly 150 labs with 4,050 faculties and also we have eight research hospitals and they are uh, play placed all over pa Paris. We have some historical places and we have uh, certain places in Paris where we have some spot of the university. Um, and um, we have uh, very interesting uh, uh, buildings. And inside these buildings, you have so, uh, on the left some uh, very old and uh, uh, famous uh, places with a museum also but also uh, parts where uh, we can work. And uh, on the right, you have uh, two, uh, two images of, uh, of the places that are convenient uh, to work in. In the, in the top right, you, you, have, uh, you see also um, the environment. You can see from the, from the windows, you, you can see here the Notre Dame de Paris. Uh, that is seen from the working uh, rooms. But uh, uh, not only the environment is good, but we, thanks to this environment, we can uh, work well. And um, we have scheduled the time of the conference that is uh, early June uh, 2022. And we think that uh, a three-day three conference will be uh, enough with uh, one or two tracks, uh, depending on the number of uh, papers that are concerned. And uh, in order to prepare your venue to Paris, we scheduled to have a call for conference on July the 1st, uh, um, 2021. 
And the deadline for uh, special sessions and the paper submission uh, are respectively, would be respectively on uh, September 1st, uh, 21 and uh, January 22. From a scientific po point of view, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Xuan to have accepted to be uh, an honorary chair. Uh, for the general chairs and, uh, and the program chairs, uh, they have already uh, accepted to uh, par participate to uh, the conference and to work with us in order to have a, a, a good conference. We think that um, it uh, will stress on the competitions and organizing competitions because uh, it enables to have some uh, benchmark and the large data sets to make science uh, go ahead. So we have uh, two uh, chairs that will uh, take, into, uh, take this charge. Um, one thing that has not been done before, we, uh, we hope to have a doctoral consortium in order to have the young people uh, have more contact with uh, seniors. And, and um, we'll have uh, special sessions and uh, publication shares, and we hope to, to have uh, uh, something that is uh, as well as you have uh, already done on the two last uh, XPRI. Uh, the exhibition and industrial liaison, uh, we have some persons that have not uh, till answered the invitation, but we think we, we find uh, rather easily. Publicity chairs are quite important in order to have a large participation and uh, sponsorship chairs are necessary also to have a, a good environment in, a, in the conference. And finally, Florence Clopet, some, some uh, uh, researcher in our team will uh, be char in charge of the organization. Uh, but after you have work, it's, uh, it's good to, to have uh, lunch or dinner. And um, you see here on, uh, uh, on, uh, on the bottom left, you have the Procop, that is the oldest uh, restaurant in Paris. Um, in the top left, you have uh, the Brasserie Lip, where the president, uh, uh, the last president, uh, Mitterrand, where, was going very often. Um, you have uh, Les Deux Magots, that's uh, some quite well-known uh, uh, place, and uh, La Tour d'Argent. And all these places, very famous, are uh, at less than five minutes from, uh, from our university and uh, where we'll, we'll do the conference. And after uh, dinner, you can have some uh, entertainment and uh, uh, you can visit some uh, cultural heritage places, has uh, the opera or some theater, and you can uh, walk along uh, the Canal Saint-Martin or go in uh, Pigalle and uh, see uh, the Moulin Rouge and uh, other uh, famous places. Um, finally, uh, I can, uh, we can show you uh, an overview of Paris and um, if you see my, uh, my mouse, uh, we are speaking you from this point. I don't know if you can realize the things, but uh, that's, that's where we are in the <coughs> center of Paris. So we'll uh, give you an overview of all the monuments that you can uh, visit and places in, uh, in Paris. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
On vient pour Corbonne. So, uh, as you have seen, Paris is a place to work and also uh, a place full of uh, entitlement. And three days will not be enough to see all what can uh, be, be seen. But uh, we, the, the Parisian teams in uh, Pride, uh, will prepare with pleasure for you and with you a fine and constructive tip to XPRI 22. And uh, we are waiting for you and hope to be alive uh, in life, uh, but we never know what can happen uh, till uh, 22. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much, Professor Vincent and Professor Kurt. Well, we, are, uh, look, we look forward uh, to ICPR AI 2022 in Paris. And uh, now we have the proposal from Korea and the Professor Seung Hwan Lee will present his proposal. Professor Lee, please. I'm very honored to propose to host 2024 ICPRAI in Jeju Island, Korea during the week, last week of May. So, uh, we we have very beautiful places in Jeju Island. So the contents is like this. So the uh, let me introduce Jeju Island. So this uh, island is located at the Northeast Asia, at the hub of Northeast Asia. It is very close to major cities in Korea, China, Taiwan, and Japan. Also, Jeju is a special self-governing province located in the southwest of the Korean Peninsula. Why Jeju? So, it provides premium service. Also, Jeju Island is a carbon-free island. Also, they provide unique venues to host this conference. And so also it provides close proximity to tour, tourist attractions. So uh, we have very wonderful MICE facilities, accessibility and transportation, tour program and support system for attendees. It is located at the hub of Northeast Asia. Jeju is free international city. Also, it is a Korea's designated international convention city. So, uh, Jeju is a visa-free city. So, it is very convenient to come to Jeju Island with no visa and no tax required. Also, uh, we have direct flights from several cities and countries. So, for local support, we have uh, Jeju Convention and the Visitors Bureaus. The proposed venue is ICC Jeju. This is a very ideal place for a convention combined with leisure and recreation. It is world-class <laughs> facilities. So uh, ICC Jeju has experienced such as 
World Regional Government Association meeting in 2007, and recently Jeju Chamber International Asia Pacific Conference in 2019. So this is a proposed conference program, tentative scientific schedule. So we will have first call for papers from the September 1st, 2023, and we will have final uh, paper submissions at the end of February. And finally, we will have a main conference during the last week of May. So, and uh, uh, we programs are structured as below. And uh, we will have a four day conference. So the uh, for, at the first day, we will have a registration and workshop and the welcome reception. <coughs> During the second and third and the last day, we have uh, keynote speeches and oral sessions and the post sessions and the banquets and the closing ceremonies. This conference will be hosted by uh, Korean Artificial Internet Association and the Research Center for AI at Korea University and other uh, supporting societies. So this is a very tentative uh, uh, committee we will set up, we will establish the holder uh, governance systems in short time. So uh, this is the uh, uh, introduction for myself. So uh, let me skip this slide. So this is budget estimation. So we will have uh, uh, this level of uh, attendee breakdowns. And so, and so the total budget will be around 200,000 US dollars. So as for the accommodations, we have very excellent, uh, cheap, uh, in short distance, in near distance, we have very uh, good, reasonable, uh, accommodations. The, the price is very cheap. So we have, uh, of course, many attractions around the conference venue. So uh, Manjang Cave, Hyoje Beach, and very beautiful places. Also, we have a uh, uh, nature close activities and attractions. Also, we have a very wonderful local dishes at this city. So let me play the commercial video. Oh, the video is not working. The audio is not working yet. Sorry. Sorry, the audio is not working. It's okay. The scenery is uh, beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, what we do is to ask the audience if you have uh, any opinion about holding it in Korea. Since we could not hold it in China this time, so uh, we thought it would be okay to hold it in Asia uh, because we could not hold it in China this time. So that's the idea and uh, hope you like uh, this proposal. If you have any uh, opinions, uh, please express them now. Since we don't hear anything, any uh, objection, so I would declare that the proposal by Korea will be approved by the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Is that up to you? Yes. So now uh, we will come to the next stage of our uh, program, and uh, we will uh, have the awards first. So please uh, stop your share, Professor Lee. So we have the sponsors. Yes. Uh, yeah, by University of Macau. CLCS represents Chinese Language Computer Society by Baptist University, World Scientific, who wins, and also uh, technology, and uh, CVTE, and also Shanghai uh, Laboratory of Multi Dimensional Information Processing as well as uh, Sun Yat-sen University. So we have also Beijia Software uh, sponsoring the conference. So uh, to have a little uh, gesture to appreciate your uh, support, we have uh, made a plaque. So this is the plaque to all our uh, sponsors. So uh, the plaque will be uh, sent to all the sponsors. So as far as the uh, sponsors, uh, we appreciate very much uh, your support. And uh, so I will try to uh, read out the names. We have uh, Dr. Chao Ning Liu of Chinese Language Computer Society. Roland Chin, uh, President of Baptist University, uh, now represented by Professor P.C. Yuan at this conference. Dr. Yang Ming from CVTE and uh, Jun Tan from the Ideal Child uh, Company. Ms. Liu of Beijia and also uh, Chen Huang Hongfeng uh, from Guangzhou, China, uh, the technology company, Cheryl Wang from Toronto, and also Yang Jun of uh, Wins uh, Company, and also uh, Huang Shan Kang uh, of the Chinese community, Zhongshan, in Montreal. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> and uh, the last but not the least is Professor Wai Wai Tan from University of Macau, uh, who has also been very supportive and being the general chair. So we have a different plaque for him. So this is a special uh, talk for you, Professor Wang Wei Tang, a big one. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.